So my name is Peter Welle. I work at Blockstream. I, uh, I've been a, what I do there, I contribute to Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin uh, research in general, and I work on various proposals uh, for some time now. And today I will be talking about Schnorr Signatures for Bitcoin, which is a project that we've been working on on and off for, I guess, a couple of years now. Uh, I'll talk about the cool things we can do that may be non-obvious and also uh, a number of non-obvious challenges we ran into while doing this. Um, this is, as, as this talk covers uh, things we've done over a long time, uh, there are many other people who have contributed to this work, uh, including Greg Maxwell, Andrew Polstra, uh, but also comes from Russell sitting here uh, and some uh, external contributors, Peter Detman and Yannick Serin. So I wanted to mention all of them. Um, and not to forget Jonas Nick. Okay, so um, I will be... Schnorr signatures have, have been talked about for a while uh, and the usual mentioned advantages of this, this approach are we can decrease the on-chain size of transactions in Bitcoin. Uh, we can speed up validation, so reduce the computational costs. There are privacy improvements that can be made. Um, so I will be talking about those and the problems we've uh, encountered. So for starters, uh, let's talk very briefly about Bitcoin itself. Um, transactions consist of outputs and inputs. Outputs provide conditions for spending, as Russell has been talking about in his previous talk, there are effectively predicates um, that need to be satisfied, and inputs, those provide the arguments to those predicates, and um, typically outputs, the, 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 the predicate that is included is require a signature with key X. This is the most common thing, but it is by no means the only thing we can do. Um, Bitcoin also supports threshold signatures in a very naive way. Um, so threshold signatures are schemes where you have a group of n possible keys and you uh, decide ahead of time that any subset out of k out of those n are able to uh, provide a valid signature, but with less it is not possible. Um, Bitcoin does this naively by just giving the list of all the keys and all the signatures, which is an, an obvious naive way of, of implementing this, this construction, but by no means the best thing that we can do. And important here for what I'll be talking about later is that in sort of the blockchain model, the, block, the chain itself, which means all the full nodes that validate the chain, do not actually care who signs. Um, if, if there are multiple possible signers, say, uh, for example, I have a wallet on my desktop computer, but I want to make sure that, I, um, that I'm protected against software attacks. Uh, maybe I also want a hardware device and I want to use a system where both my desktop and my phone or my hardware device need to sign off on a transaction. So th this is a two of two or two of three multisig construction. Um, now, if I want someone to pay me, I'm, I am the one who's going to decide what conditions they should be sending that money to. So I will tell them, uh, create an output of this much money to um, an address that encodes two of three, and these are the keys to use. And we have a compact pay-to-script hash approach for that. Um, but it is me who cares about who those signers are. It is not the blockchain. Uh, the chain only sees, yep, there was supposed to be a key with this signature. There is one. It's good. Um, so how Bitcoin accomplishes this is through scripting language. Um, which is a stack-based machine. Uh, the most simple example you can come up with is an output that says public key checksig, and then an input that contains a signature. Um, the execution model is you first 
execute the input, the result is a signature that remains on the stack, um, and then you execute the output commands, which pushes the public key onto it, the check sig, check sig looks at the public key, the signature, they match, good, uh, the transaction is good to go. Uh, in practice, what happens is I do not tell the, my senders uh, an actual public key, I give them a hash of a public key originally for compactness reasons, but there are other advantages. Um, and you can see the, the, the script that's being used for that. Effectively, what this script does is take two inputs, a signature and a public key, verify A, that the hash of that public key is X, and B, that that signature is valid for that public key. Going forward, as we'll be talking about threshold signatures, um, Bitcoin's way of dealing with threshold signatures is through an opcode called check multisig, which takes a number of keys and a number of signatures, matches them, them all, and uh, here you can see how, how this works. Uh, other things that the Bitcoin scripting language can do are hash pre-images and time locks, which are uh, used in various higher level protocols. Okay. Oh, and I should also uh, say that Bitcoin script uses ECDSA, uh, common standard, but let's talk about Schnorr signatures now. So um, Schnorr signatures are a well-known uh, signature scream that only relies on the discrete logarithm assumption, uh, just like ECDSA does. Um, And there are various advantages known for Schnorr over ECDSA. Uh, some of them are, uh, it supports native multi-signatures. So uh, multi-signatures, mul multiple parties jointly produce a single signature. Um, this is very nice because we can reduce the number of keys, the number of signatures that need to go into the chain. Uh, there are various schemes that uh, enable threshold signatures on top of Schnorr. Um, and in fact, it is known that, that it is, there are constructions to effectively implement any boole monotone Boolean function. So, talk a bit about that. Monotone Boolean function is, a, is the class of functions from Booleans to Booleans uh, that can be written only using AND and OR gates. And uh, as long as we restrict ourselves to um, spending conditions that consists of some group of people signs off or some other group of people signs off. Um, this is a, exactly the class that we want to model. And it is in fact known that there are schemes that sometimes have complicated setup protocols, um, but it is actually possible to uh, negotiate keys ahead of time in such a way that A and B or B and C and D or D and F uh, or whatever, uh, can eventually sign for this. Um, we, we recently published a paper about a scheme called MuSig, um, which does native multi-signatures, but without any setup. I'll talk a bit more about that later, so that can also be used. Further advantages of Schnorr signatures, uh, they support batch validation, so this is, uh, the idea that you can have multiple sets of combinations of keys and messages um, and verify them all at once uh, in a way that is computationally more efficient than doing them individually. Uh, Schnorr signatures actually have a security proof, which is not true for ECDSA. Uh, they're also provably non-malleable, so a third party that does not have access to a private key cannot modify the signature without invalidating it. Um, simply by virtue of introducing a new signature scheme, we get a number of advantages for free. One of them is that ECDSA signatures in Bitcoin right now use DER encoding, which adds about six bytes of uh, completely unnecessary data to the chain for every signature. So we can just get rid of that uh, once we go to something else. Um, and I should say that most of the things on this slide are in theory also possible with ECDSA, but they usually, it usually comes with very complicated multi-party computation protocols. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about some things that are 
where this is not the case. So, can we add this to Bitcoin script? It seems like an almost obvious win. We make the exact same security assumptions. There's only advantages. Um, ignoring the politics for a second, it seems like we can just add a new opcode to the scripting language, which is uh, especially easy since uh, Bitcoin now has segregated witness uh, active and part of that system added script versioning, which means that we can basically introduce new uh, or propose new uh, scripts with new semantics from scratch uh, uh, without much effort. Um, there are other advantages that, that come from this, so uh, I'll talk about two. Um, one of them is Taproot, uh, which if you've follow to Bitcoin mailing list over the past few days, you may have seen mentioned. It's a proposal by Greg Maxwell, um, where effectively um, the realization is that almost all signatures can be, re or almost all cases where a script gets satisfied, so where an actual spend occurs, um, and there are multiple parties involved, can almost always be written as either everyone involved agrees or some more complicated uh, conditions that are satisfied. And Taproot encodes a public key or the hash of a script inside just one public key that goes onto the chain. And you can't, cannot tell from the key whether uh, it is just a key or it is in fact a key that also commits to a script. And so the proposed semantics for this would allow you to either just spend it uh, by providing a signature with a key that's there, or you reveal that no, this was actually a commitment to a particular script and then you give the inputs to satisfy that script. Um, if that signature used in Taproot proposal would be a Schnorr signature, we automatically get all the advantages that, we, uh, that I talked about in the previous slide. So um, not only can this be used for just a single signer, but we get uh, the everyone agrees automatically by using a native uh, Schnorr multi-signature. Um, other advantage of Schnorr, Schnorr uh, is something that Andrew has been working on, scriptless scripts. Um, there was a talk about this recently at Real World Crypto, which I think was very good. Um, you should, and the, the idea here is um, how much of the features of an actual scripting language can we accomplish without having a scripting language? And, and it turns out quite a bit. Um, in particular, uh, there is a construction called an atomic swap or a cross-chain atomic swap, uh, which I won't go into the details here, but it allows multiple, so uh, I, I want to sell someone some Bitcoin and someone else wants to sell me some Litecoin, I don't know why, but um, uh, assume this is the case. And um, we, we want to do this in lockstep across the chain, so because both of these systems are presumably irreversible if one of the parties sends the coins to the other one. We now have the problem of what if the other party backs out and disappears. So a cool construction for this that was uh, proposed a couple years ago is a cross-chain atomic swap where the second payment is um, dependent on using a uh, hash pre-image, which gets revealed by the other transaction. So we, we put the coins in, into a construction where um, they're locked, and then uh, when one party takes out their part of the coins, they reveal the information, I need to take their coins. And this, this makes the whole construction uh, atomic. And uh, it, it turns out so, so the normal formulation of this always relies on the hash pre-image that's being revealed and proven ahead of time that will work. Um, it turns out um, that this is possible with just a Schnorr signature, and this makes it both indistinguishable from a normal payment, um, plus it makes it smaller and, and all things, and so this would just fit into 
that route as well. So there, there are many cool things we can do with Schnorr signature. Yes, we want this. Um, this is the wrong slide. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about this first. Um, so why stop at one signature per input? Um, Bitcoin transactions have multiple independent outputs and we don't want to restrict the ability for someone to choose them independently, but all of these have public keys and signatures that are required. Why can't we combine all those signatures into one? Uh, Schnorr signatures support uh, multi-signatures, so um, this seems like an obvious win. So, not so fast. Um, here I'll show a few equations, though I'm trying to keep it light. Uh, so the message is M, the public key is capital X, where X is the private key small x multiplied by the generator G, and the signature is a tuple R and S, which is valid if S times G equals R plus this hash that commits to uh, the public key used the uh, R value in the signature and the message multiplied by the public key. And what you can notice about this equation is that it is linear. Uh, the, all, all the public keys really appear at the top level, which means um, that what you can do is if multiple parties uh, effectively produce an S independently for the same R value, or for some of our values, and you add those S values up, the result is a signature that is valid for the sum of their keys. Um, and th this is how all um, multi-signature constructions for, for Schnorr work. They're all based on, on this principle. Unfortunately, there is a, a caveat here called the rogue key attack. Um, talk about that here. So assume Alice has a key A and Bob has a key B, but Bob somehow just claims, no, my key is B prime, which is really B minus A. So Bob just claims that's my key and people believe him. Um, a naive multi-signature would use the sum of the keys and B prime plus A is just B, which Bob can sign for without Alice's corporation. So, Everyone sees Alice's key, Bob's key, says I send to the sum of these keys and I assume that this will only be spendable by both Alice and Bob. This is wrong. Um, the normal way this is prevented is by requiring the keys to sign themselves. You, you have effectively an enrollment procedure or certification procedure or you include with the public keys a signature that signs itself. Um, the, there are various constructions but uh, you, you must guarantee that um, the, the parties actually have the private key corresponding to the public key they claim to have. And this works fine for the multi-signature within a single input approach because uh, the people who care about it are just the participants and they can internally prove to each other, yep, here this is my key and here is a proof that this is my key and it doesn't go onto the blockchain. But for cross-input aggregation, if we want to reduce all the inputs in a transaction to one, this is actually not possible. Because the set of keys that sign are under the, the control of the attacker. So uh, the example, again, say Alice has a number of bitcoins associated in an output with key A, and Bob wants to seal, steal them. Um, and we use a naive multi-signature approach where we just require a signature with the sum of all the keys we see, then what Bob can do is create an output in a transaction himself of just some marginally small amount addressed to the key B minus A, and then create a follow-up transaction that spends both Alice's coin and Bob's coin in such a way that they cancel out. So this, this is a completely insecure uh, situation and I believe the only way to, to prevent it is by effectively including the self-certification signature inside the blockchain itself which would undo all the um, scaling and performance advantages we, we assume to have. So what we need is 
uh, what is called security in the plain public key model, where there is no key setup procedure beyond just users claiming that they have a particular key. And they can even lie, they are allowed to lie about what their key is and the system remains secure. So this was, uh, this was something we noticed and we tried to come up with a solution for, tried to publish about it, um, got rejected, uh, and we were told, you should look at this paper by Belair and Neve from 2006, um, who exactly solved this problem. So uh, where Schnorr signatures use S times G plus, equals R plus the hash of the XRM times X, where X then becomes the sum of, of the public keys, um, Belair and Neve introduces a separate hash for every signer, and into every hash goes the set of all the signers. And uh, the great thing about this paper is it, it gives a, a very wide security proof where the attacker is allowed to uh, pretty much do anything. Uh, attacker can participate in multiple signing attempts with multiple people simultaneously. Um, th this looks exactly like the security model we want. So. Uh, Let's go for this. Let's, let's uh, start thinking about how we can integrate this into Bitcoin scripting language. Again, not so fast. There's another hurdle. Um, and that is the distinction between a multi-signature and an interactive aggregate signature. Uh, the distinction is really a multi-signature, you have multiple signers that all sign the same message, where in an interactive aggregate signature, every signer has their own message. Um, seem, seem simple, and, um, but in the context of Bitcoin, every input is really signing its own message that authorizes, that, that specifies the, the claim of um, uh, authorizing the spend. So uh, there is an, an, a very simple conversion suggested by Belay and Neve themselves in their paper where you can turn the multi-signature scheme into an interactive interactive aggregate signature scheme where you just concatenate the messages of all the participants. And um, this seems so obviously uh, correct that we didn't really think about it until my colleague Russell pointed out something that we've come to call Russell's attack. And uh, <laughs> um, so let's assume Alice has two outputs, O1 and O2. Bob has an output, O3. Um, and we assume M1 is the message that authorizes a spend of O1, M2 is the message that uh, authorizes a spend of O2, and so on. Um, Alice wants to spend O1 in a coin join with Bob. So there is some uh, multi-party protocol going on. Uh, it was mentioned in one of the earlier talks. Coin join is multiple participants move their, uh, their coins uh, at the same time. And now you can't tell anymore which of the outputs really belong to, to, to the inputs. Uh, it's a very reasonable thing that Alice and Bob would, would want to do this. Um, so in this protocol, Bob would be able to claim he has the same key as Alice, which is in the, the plain public key model perfectly allowed. And he chooses as message M2, the message that authorizes the spend of, of Alice's second output instead of M3, his own output. And you, 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 you may claim that, well, uh, it is... Uh, perfectly possible to modify the protocol where you say, well, don't ever sign something where someone else is claiming to have your keys. But th this is really a higher level uh, construction and we, we would very much like the underlying protocol to protect against this sort of situation. Um, so if you now look at what the validation equation becomes, uh, you see that XA, so uh, Alice's public key appears twice, and the concatenation of the two messages appears twice. Um, but these two hashes are identical. So what uh, Bob can do is duplicate all of Alice's messages in the multi-party protocol and end up with a signature that actually authorizes the spend of Alice's second output, which was unintended. Um, a better solution, uh, 
that we are proposing is that uh, instead into this L, which is the hash of a commitment of all the participants in the set, you include the messages themselves, and then in the top level hashes, you just include your position within that hash. Uh, so the tag doesn't work anymore because the messages in, in every hash are, are different, so um, Alice can now not, no, Bob can now not uh, just repeat Bob's message and uh, steal things. So uh, something to learn about this, uh, at least for myself, is uh, attack models in multi-party schemes can be very subtle. This, this was not at all an obvious uh, construction. So uh, here I guess I should through the slide that I had before. Sorry if I'm making you seasick. Um, so concretely, um, how do we integrate this Belay and Neva-like interactive aggregate signature scheme into Bitcoin? Because this seems to give us all the advantages we want. We can uh, turn all the keys within a particular input into one using multi-signature and threshold signatures and then use the aggregation across multiple um, inputs to even reduce that further and only have one signature for the entire transaction. How do we do this? Because there, there is a hurdle here. Um, Bitcoin transactions are independent. We, we really have this model of there is an output which has a predicate, you provide an input with uh, all the arguments needed to satisfy it, um, and the transaction is valid if all the predicates are satisfied plus a number of other uh, constraints like you're not double spending and you're not creating money out of nothing and all those things. Um, but for cross-input aggregation, we really want one signature overall. And the, um, the way to do it is, in, in, or at least what I would propose is, um, have the check sig operator and the related operators always succeed. So uh, right now they take a public key and a signature from the stack and validate whether uh, they correspond. Instead, make it always succeed and, and don't provide a signature, just a public key, compute what message would have been signed, but remember it. Uh, so continue with the val validation of all the inputs within a transaction and now the transaction is valid if all the input predicates succeed still, but in addition, uh, there is an overall Belayaneva interactive aggregate signature provided in the transaction that is valid for all the delayed checks. And uh, this is a bit of a, um, I guess a, a layer violation, but, but I, I believe one that is very much worth it because we, we get all these savings. So uh, I want to talk a bit about the actual work we've been doing towards that end. Um, now I need to fly around again. Now, here, performance, that's what I want. Um, so um, Andrew, Jonas, and me have been looking at various algorithms for doing um, the, the multi-scalar multiplication involved in the Belayaneva verification equation, and it turns out there's, a, there's various algorithms that give you uh, better than a constant speed up. So you, you, you can compute A times B plus C times D plus E times F faster than computing the multiplication separately and then adding them up. This is a well-known result, but th th there is really a variety of algorithms. So um, we experimented with multiple of them. What you can see here is uh, how many keys are involved in, in the whole transaction. Um, and then the speed up you get over just a linear uh, uh, over just val validating those keys independently. So um, you have two algorithms, one is Strauss and the other is Pippinger. Um, after various benchmark and tweeting, tweaking, sorry, um, uh, a, a tweaking at, at what the, 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 the correct point is to switch over from one to the other. Um, so you can see that initially for small numbers, the Strauss algorithm is significantly faster, but at some point Pippinger takes over and Pippinger really goes up 
logarithmically in the number of keys. And this seems to continue for quite a while. So our overall validation speed for n keys is really n over log n, as if we're talking about large numbers. Um, you may think, well, there's never going to be a transaction with 10,000 keys in it, right? You don't, you're all already doing all this cool little threshold uh, scheme, so there's only one key left in every, every output, so you'd need thousands of inputs. This is where batch validation comes in, because um, Belayanev's validation equation um, can also be batch validated, where you have just multiple instances of the equation that can be validated in parallel, and you don't care about if they fail, which one fails. If you're seeing multiple transactions in a block, all you care about is this block valid or not. Um, so um, e effectively these numbers apply to all the public keys and signatures you see in a transaction rather than just within, uh, within a block rather than just a transaction. And there it is perfectly feasible that we see several thousands. So this is a nice speed up. Um, furthermore, there are also space savings. Uh, this is a sim from a simulation uh, where we assume if every, if, if this sort of proposal would have been active in Bitcoin since day one. Um, how much smaller would the blockchain be? Uh, note that this does not do anything with threshold signatures or multi-signatures. It does not try to incorporate um, how people would have differently used the system, because that's really where, where the advantage lies. This is purely from the multiple uh, we're just going to be left with one signature per transaction, but everything else is left in place. And you can see a, a sort of a 30%, between 25, 30% uh, reduction in uh, what the block size would have been. So that's mostly a bandwidth improvement and a storage improvement, but it's nice. Um, so ongoing work, we're working on a BIP for Belarineva based interactive aggregated signatures. Um, so then we can present this as a, just a signature scheme on itself. Then there's a separate BIP uh, we're working on for incorporating this cross-input capable check sig and what the exact semantics uh, would be. Apparently I lost a word here, but recommended approaches for doing various kinds of threshold signing um, so we don't need to stick with this everyone uh, involved in a contract needs to be independently providing a signature, and uh, that's it. Great, we have, we have time for uh, questions. So any hope of aggregating some signatures across transactions? So, um, a question. <laughs> um, I expected something like that from you. Um, so the, the, there is a proposal uh, by Taj, I don't know if he's here, to uh, where you can effectively combine even across the transaction half, you, you, you can effectively do a batch validation ahead of time and look what multipliers you would apply and on the R value you can combine the whole R value into a single one. Um, however, uh, this is, is even more of a layer violation than uh, transaction validation is, and it comes with, with um, extra complications, like what if you now have a, a transaction that has been validated ahead of time and its validation was, was cached, but now you see it inside of a block uh, and you, you, you need to combine this. And, uh, I guess what you're aiming for is uh, BLS signatures where you can arbitrarily and non-interactively combine um, all, all signatures. I, I think that is something we should look into, but I'd rather use all the possibilities we have with the current existing security assumptions and then uh, perhaps at some time uh, later consider what can be done. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, one question about Taproot. Uh, 
the introduction of this standard case where everybody signs and agrees uh, would basically reduce the number of times where you actually see the, the contract that is being executed at all? Wouldn't that massively reduce the anonymity set for people that actually then execute a contract? Oh, interesting question. Um, I don't think so, because in the alternative case where those people um, would have a contract that explicitly stated everyone agrees or more complicated set, you would still see, you, you, you're going from three cases, one is just single signature, single key, to everyone signs uh, with multiple keys uh, and third group more complicated constructions. And what we've now, what we're doing with Taproot is effectively unifying the first and the second branch, but the third one is unaffected. So I believe this is strictly not the case. You had a, alluded to political reasons why this might not be merged. Um, they seem really cool. Why wouldn't you want to merge this? Like, what are the reasons against it? <laughs> um, so, I would very much like to see what I've been presenting about today merged into Bitcoin at some point, but that is going to be a lengthy process and uh, where there's a long review and uh, this is one of the reasons why I uh, prefer to stick with proposals that don't change, change the security assumptions at all. So uh, none of what I've been talking about introduces any assumptions that ECDSA doesn't already have. So this makes it hopefully uh, relatively easy to uh, see that there are little downsides. Yeah, um, an extra elaboration on the taproot point, which is that it you can uh, you're not limited to have the all agree case. So the taproot root could also be signed for for like a a two of three. So if your policy was something like two of three or one of three with a time lock, then the uh, case that looks like just a single key could just be the two of three at the top. And so that's another factor that would help keep the anonymity sets pretty good. On that. Uh, this is not entirely a blockchain related question, but uh, just the Schnorr signature. I'm wondering about its availability uh, for, you know, in sort of open source or widely available software like OpenSSL. Uh, my business case would be uh, just firmware update signature done by multiple parties. So um, the, the most commonly deployed Schnorr-like signature is at 255.19 at this point, which is very well known and used in a number of, of cases. And I believe there are higher level protocols that specify um, how to do aggreg ag aggregating multiple keys together um, and sign for them at once. You may want to look into a system called COSI or COSI, C-O-S-I. Thanks, Peter.